Good morning and welcome to the stream. Uh, hopefully the audio worked the first time this time. Woo. Um, today we are doing our this thing that we do. Uh, sorry, why is the view like this? I, oh no. Well, I just want to see my normal thing. Um, can I move? Nope. All right. Well, can I move that? back down to where it goes. Yes. Yes. There we go. Hi. Uh, I'm a little rushed this morning because I was working to finish the links before stream and maybe I should not have done that and uh, it did not give me quite enough time to do everything else I usually do in the morning. Uh, with that in mind, welcome to my channel. Uh, my name is Dr. Rachel Tapman and my channel is for anybody who cares about... Ah, good to hear the, the audio is great. Anyone who cares about language technology and other people. And I've got an action-packed uh, double header. I think double shot is what I called it, like a like a double shot of es espresso. It's a it's a coffee pun. Today um, we've got some research papers I want to talk about, and just like research discussion, we've got a bunch of practical stuff as usual. Some jobs in there, um, politics. There's been some court cases, some legislation, um, some maybe hints of forthcoming legislation from from the U.S. government. Who knows? We'll see. Um, and then we've got some ethics discussion. Um, and not that many points, but I have a lot to say about them. Uh, and finally, I got some just fun stuff. Why am I speaking fast? Am I? I guess that I have just been very busy this morning. It's got the blood going. Perhaps. Oh, the web page is looking washed out. <laughs> Let me take a peek. That looks good to me. I can double check. Ah, hello, AM, good to see you. Um, I don't think I have any filters or anything on it. Yeah, I don't, so question mark. Hopefully when we are looking at things that aren't the search page at Ecosia, uh, it will be slightly easier to see. All right, let's jump right in. Uh, so, actually, one sec. Let me first make this the good size. Huh. Uh, eh, there we go. Um, it's been, like I mentioned, a very busy morning. We also had somebody come out uh, who, uh, I mentioned last time we had like a medium-sized catastrophe and we had the um, insurance appraiser out this morning and it's just a whole big thing. Anyway, blurry. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. All right, let me adjust this a little bit because we're all gonna be looking at it together and it would be helpful if it looked good and not bad. Um, let's look at our first uh, first page and see if that helps because I'm not like super zoomed in or out or anything. All right, well, um, if you are on the links here, you've already got the link, so you can you can follow them along. It is readable. Okay, well, that's good. I'll uh, look into that later. So first off, paper. Um, so this was, I thought, a particularly interesting paper. Uh, it's a sociology paper, and it is, it's been published in Energy Research and Social Science. Um, and it's... Um, it's not a preprint because it's already been published, so it's an actual paper. Um, and it was looking at a bunch of uh, participants from Europe and their, I think the UK actually, um, stance on smart home technology and what they thought about it. Uh, and they were, um, yeah, they were in the UK. They were also looking at gender dynamics and the potential difference there. Uh, and I thought there were a couple things in here that were particularly interesting. So I'm just going to scroll. It's a sociology papers tend to be much longer <laughs> uh, and, you know, more uh, well fleshed out, uh, to put it that way, uh, than um, a lot of uh, computer science papers. They're more fleshed out because they are longer. Wow, a little sip of coffee. Did I refill my water bottle? I did not. My water bottle's empty. That's okay. It's fine. <laughs> uh, busy morning. Um, and there were two figures I really wanted to uh, 
pull out here. So let me see if I can find them really quick. Yeah, okay. Um, so these are broken down by gender and they were only looking at male and female participants. Um, and they were looking at uh, sort of how people responded to smart home technology. Um, and one thing that I thought was interesting is the difference in sort of the way that people, the, the gender breakdown in potential benefits and then the gender breakdown in how risks are assessed. Um, so uh, in general, looking across categories, it seems like there's sort of a, a bias of the female respondents, which are the top bar uh, to respond um, that they are more likely to agree that smart home appliances will make life easier, right? So, uh, or, you know, will have potential benefits. So, um, saving energy, saving time, saving money, um, environment. I think that's like improving the environment of the world, not the environment of the home. Um, enhancing leisure, uh, and then improving security, interestingly, is the one uh, one of two benefits that, uh, it's very, very slight, I would say this probably isn't statistically difficult, different, uh, where men said that, um, or the male respondent said that it was more likely to be a benefit of these systems than women did. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to bring up, um, I think it's quite far down. There's also um, a little bit of a um, um, bias, certainly in linguistic experiments where female respondents are slightly likely to rate things slightly more positively. And I'm not entirely sure if they corrected for it or not. I have not, in fact, read the whole paper top to bottom. I did skim it. Um, and then some of the the risks that there were um, differences between is that a lot of the privacy risks uh, men tended to rate higher. So uh, in particular, revealing sensitive data and an invasion of privacy, that one is probably um, just, you know, just straight up and down uh, the same. But if we go to the end, there's another uh, figure about sort of like their main worries. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, maybe did I pass it? Scroll, 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 scroll. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the degree to which um, respondents by gender uh, felt about these technologies. So even though uh, male respondents were more likely to say that they were a security risk, um, they were also more likely to say that it made them feel safe and protected than female response respondents, which is interesting. Um, and that the biggest sort of gender difference where um, women scored higher was that it made them feel lazy and exposed. Um, so it's interesting that even though when thinking about the potential risks, men tended to be more conservative about those risks, when it comes to sort of the, the feelings associated with the technology after using it, men tend not to have those feelings. As much. I mean, as you can see, most of these bars track each other pretty well. Uh, I just thought it was interesting. Uh, and quick citation for this is uh, controlling, frightening, or fun, exploring the gender dynamics of smart home technology preferences in the United Kingdom. Um, and just as an aside, I personally uh, do not espouse <laughs> almost all smart home technology. Uh, if it is smart, it is surveilling you. Um, with with some um, differences, there was a, a cool project that someone was talking about on Twitter um, recently, where their um, their kid uh, in, in built like a, a whole network firewall for their house that didn't allow any advertising packets through. Um, so that's the type of smart home <laughs> I can get behind. Uh, but in general, I'm not a fan. All right. Uh, and now we've got, let me zoom in on this as well, uh, a preprint, so this has not been published, um, out of uh, a bunch of people in Seattle. Uh, and it just sort of, I thought it was sort of technically interesting. Um, so of course the benefit of transformers as a class of models is that they are more parallelizable than recurrent neural networks, which was sort of the previous um, most used class of models in natural language processing. Um, and this is a um, even more um, parallelized version of training large language models, which are based on transformers. Um, and in particular, um, 
you know, uh, it's possible to independently train subparts of a new class of LLMs on different subsets of the data, eliminating the massive multi-node synchronization currently required to train LLMs. So basically you can train uh, a lot of little models and squish them together into a single model, um, which is uh, nice to have evidence of. Good, pleasantly intuitive result. I don't know if or when this will be published and accepted. So, uh, and then, uh, so this is from Talia Ringer. We've talked about them on the channel before. Uh, and I thought this was a particularly good discussion of um, perverse incentive. So basically the idea of a perverse incentive is you are trying to get something uh, the things that happen to try and make that something happen are in fact the opposite of what you want or end up with a system that does the thing that you said you wanted it to do, um, but doesn't actually fulfill your needs, right? So I think the classic example is like, um, in a nail factory, if you're incentivizing the total weight of nails made, it makes sense to make a single very large nail. Uh, and if you're incentivizing number of nails made, it makes sense to um, make a lot of very uh, small, you know, probably cheaply made nails. Um, and probably neither of those are what you want. You want more production of high quality nails that your customers want to buy, um, but that's not what you incentivize by picking a metric. Oh, looks good, Tandres. Thank you, that's helpful. It could also have been, uh, I didn't get a notification about it, but it could have been dropping packets at the beginning of the stream, so. Are the captions working? I didn't check. I usually check a bunch of stuff before stream that I didn't because I was rushing this time, and I'm just going to trust in past Rachel that she set it up correctly because I believe in myself. Um, so, perverse incentives. Um, and uh, this is in response to this particular uh, thread about a paper uh, where the claim is that language models can teach themselves to program better. Um, and uh, Talia says, since this is not by a student, I feel okay saying that it's important to remember that passing tests does not mean programming correctly, and that when you feed back in programs that pass tests, your tool learns to overfit to these tests even when producing buggy code, right? So. Perverse intensives, I want my code to pass all the tests. Well, you know, if your test is, um, uh, let's say you have like a, a test based on a specific data point that's like, hey, whenever I ask for the latitude and longitude of I don't know, New York City, I get the correct latitude and longitude. Well, you could pass that test by always passing back the latitude and longitude of New York City whenever I ask for the latitude and longitude of a place, even though it's not actually a helpful program to build. It is a, according to the tests, correct program. Captions are unavailable. No. Uh, Crack says it's working fine. Good, good, good. Can I fix that? Well, the stream's in flight. Mm -mm -mm. Let me make sure this is a muted tab first before I try messing around with it for a little while. Um, gosh dang it. Well, beans. <sighs> Sorry about that. You have to turn it on individually every single time. And I could have sworn I did it this time, but I, I guess I didn't. Apologies. Um, yeah. Uh, so a, uh, a good citation of that as well. Um, so this is from uh, Talia, and this is a, um, you know, example of how you can't just create good programs <laughs> by just passing the test, right? Like test development works for humans because we know that systems don't exist in isolation and we understand the rest of the system and it's a way to guide development. Um, but for machines, they like there's no understanding there, right? That's just not a thing that happens. Um, and I thought this point in particular was extremely relevant and happy, happy, helpful, uh, and uh, that it's important not to claim machine learning tools in general are good at more general things like programming, when what they're really good at is the thing you measure, generating programming puzzle solutions that pass a particular suite of tests, right? Um, and uh, to clarify, the paper seems to make measured claims about this. Actually, I think the problem is the hype in the tweet, which I, the hype in the tweet is responsible for a lot of issues in our field. Uh, and I say that as someone who is extremely on Twitter. Um, so yeah, good, good points to keep in mind. Good to have that citation. I popped that in the chat. 
Uh, what's the tweet theme I'm using for Twitter? Uh, <laughs> uh, whatever happens when you open Twitter on Edge uh, without being logged into anything. I use Edge for my streams uh, and only for my streams. Uh, and this is that, the paper that they cited. Also on the research uh, front, SIGDial is uh, going to be happening uh, September 7th through 19th. Um, I think that it is going to be in person, um, but the, the program is available. So if you're just trying to like see what the SIGDial papers are gonna be, um, you can check them out and I'll pop that link in the chat as well if you're interested in checking it out. Uh, and the... Um, SIG Dial is, uh, SIG is special interest group and Dial is short for dialogue. So if you work in chatbots or, uh, you know, discourse and dialogue uh, in any capacity, this is a good conference to keep an eye on. And I would say it's considered pretty prestigious. So you tend to get a lot of high quality work out of here. Uh, oh, okay. So it looks like you can attend online as well. Um, <laughs> Although it is not cheap. Uh, academic conferences, am I right? They aren't cheap. Uh, even if you're a student, they're pretty expensive. All right. Uh, also in the research front, uh, and I'll pop this in the chat as well. So this thread I thought was helpful. Uh, I've talked on the channel quite a bit about causal modeling. So this is a field of statistics. Um, so you know, like the old correlation isn't causation. Well, you can, with a certain degree of probability, model actual causation. Um, and the general idea of causal modeling as an approach is that you have, you know, uh, a factor you're interested in, you have a number of things that could affect that factor. Um, and what you do is with a, you know, you, you can imagine this as a, a directional acyclic graph where each of the potential factors is a, um, a node and the relationship between that factor and your, your target factor is an edge. Um, and with a certain degree of probability and, you know, various types of evidence, you can erase some of those edges uh, by reducing the probability significant sufficiently uh, for, for your needs, right? You're never going to be able to say like using this methodology X 100% and only X 100% caused Y 100% of the time. Um, it's, you know, it's statistics. They don't really deal in absolutes. Um, but uh, you can also take that approach to machine learning. Uh, Craig, can I ask you a question regarding papers? You may, feel free. I may not know the answer, but <laughs> if I do, I'll share. Uh, and this uh, thread pulls together a couple of recent papers. It's not a research area I've been paying a whole lot of attention to, but I do think it's interesting. Um, so some uh, different areas, uh, causal modeling, f sorry, <laughs> causal machine learning for healthcare and precision medicine, uh, a survey and open problems, uh, a survey on structure learning and causal discovery. The DAGs here are those directional acyclic graphs I was mentioning, um, towards causal representation learning, a review of causality for learning algorithms and medical image analysis. Um, and you may notice that a lot of the um, sort of subject area here tends to be medical. Uh, and that's because a lot of the work that's been done in causal modeling has been done in epidemiology, which is why I've been following a lot of epidemiologists for many years uh, because I was interested in causal modeling. And um, there's a very close relationship between those fields. Um, and one of the sort of like landmark causal modeling studies was, um, you know, proving that smoking causes cancer. Um, which is a thing that uh, we know <laughs> at this point. I think that's social knowledge. Uh, is causal inference used in NLP? Great question. Not really. Um, so it's the statistics that's been used in NLP is sort of a different branch. Um, I know there are some people working on it, but I would say that it's not the main subject area of causal modeling, and it's also not the main uh, method used in NLP. So while it exists, it's very much sort of a fringe research area, which doesn't mean it's not valuable and interesting. It just means there's not a lot going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Rahul says, I thought causal inference is important for reasoning about the underlying data generation process. Not sure how relevant this is for NLP. Yeah, it's sometimes it is, uh, often it is not. Uh, a lot of the sort of cause and effect stuff in NLP happens in common sense reasoning. Um, and that's usually more um, either experimental evidence from humans or, you know, um, trying to extract parts of text that like X caused Y. It doesn't tend to be generally, of course, it doesn't tend to actually use causal modeling as an approach. Uh, Woof. <laughs> Good question. Uh, Craig says, what paper would you recommend for topic segmentation on video transcripts? I have looked into unsupervised topic segmentation of meetings with BERT embeddings, but this follows meeting transcripts rather than video. Uh, do I have any other papers? No, <laughs> not, uh, unfortunately not a topic that I'm, I'm familiar enough about to pull citations out of my, out of my head. Um, yeah, I mean, my general recommendation for topic modeling is, um, it's not quite topic modeling, is to change it to a different question. Uh, because often if they're your videos, you sort of already have a bucket of topics that you're interested in that you think might be included. Um, and in those cases, I think that, you know, treating it as a supervised classification problem can be a lot more powerful for a lot of commercial approaches. Um, but if you're really doing sort of like text mining document discovery, it's not going to help you. Um, yeah. So no is the answer. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we have uh, another paper. So this is, this is an actual paper as well. It's from uh, uh, Equity and Access to Algorithms, Mechanisms, and Optimization uh, from October. October 22. This must be uh, accepted. I don't think that's, I think that's in the future. I'm not always great at months and dates, but I'm pretty sure it's not October of this year quite yet. Uh, and uh, this paper looks at um, a problem that I have run into a lot, and I imagine many of you have as well, and that is the lack of um, documentation around data sets. Um, I don't know if any of you use, use Hugging Face uh, for data sets or, or models, but a lot of times there'll be sections in the model cars or sections in the data sets that's like, and here's all the information that you should fill out about this thing, and people just don't do it. And I get it. Documentation is hard. It takes time. It's a big time sink, but ooh, it's important, and folks aren't doing it. And this paper talks about that. Um, yep. Uh, and the other big thing that they bring up in this paper is uh, that very few data sets, right? So classic Zipfian curve, uh, a small number of data sets get the most papers written about them. Now, in an NLP benchmarking um, setup, that is kind of normal. However, in a fairness setup where, in fairness scope, when you're really interested in sort of edge cases, um, you are always looking at the same edge cases, right? On sort of a population of studies level, which means that you're not actually looking at edge cases anymore, right? Um, it's sort of like how ImageNet has a lot of pictures of people wearing seatbelts. So a lot of the like image generation that's done using ImageNet, if you ask for a person, you also get a seatbelt, that sort of thing. So the statistical uh, cues in the underlying data set are going to be picked up by, by papers in the field. Um, yep, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's an issue. Uh, it also talks to a larger issue that I um, talked about on Twitter, but did not actually link here. So let me see if I can uh, get the link to that really quick. Um, where folks really focus on data set collection and annotation as a way to you know fix fairness, and that's what will make something more fair. Um, and I, you know, we've talked about a lot of things on this channel and, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not logged in. I can't scroll down far enough to get it. I've talked about a lot of things on this channel and one of the ones is that, one of the general themes that I hope has emerged for you is that harmful systems can never be fair, right? Um, if murder drone 3000 isn't sexist, I mean, good, <laughs> I guess, but it's still a murder drone, right? And the issue is that it exists and not that it is not sexist, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that, Korag. Uh, so many times the data set cards on Hugging Face are empty or just the citations are filled. Yep, uh, it's poor practice and it reflects poorly on us as a field. 
Uh, Dana says, do you think it would be helpful to create an academic journal for data sets in order to incentivize people to publish data sets and reproducible research? Something I've been thinking about working on. So there actually is, in NLP, there is a conference for data sets, right? Where that is sort of the main focus of the conference. Uh, and it is LREC. Uh, so Language Resources Evaluation and C. <laughs> uh, I think the C stands for conference. I can never remember what it stands for. Um, Louisiana Real Estate uh, Co Commission, that ain't it. Uh, and the big problem with LREC, there's a couple of them. Um, so one is that it is biannual, and it's the biannual where it happens every other year. Um, yep, so this one happened in June 2022, which means we're not going to get our next one until 2024. Uh, the other big problem with LREC is that uh, people in the field know that it exists, and as a result, if you submit a data set paper to like NLP conferences that aren't LREC, people will often tell you to go pound sand, um, which I get. We get so many reviews, so many papers to review, there's only so many slots, whatever you can use to sort of like whittle down the pile people will use, and just like, uh, we don't do data set papers is a very like easy knee-jerk response to have, but yeah, it's kind of an issue. Um, and uh, as a result, a lot of the really big data sets have been produced by commercial labs for their own ends. Um, and also maybe you get to use them, maybe. So yeah, uh, but I think that also plays well into, I'm just gonna pop this one down so we talk about it now. Um, the fact that data set releasing is not an unmitigated good, right? Um, just having a data set and making it available can, in fact, in and of itself, be a harm. Um, so this paper is from Big Data and Society. Um, that was published uh, just a couple months ago. Last month, not that long ago, a couple weeks ago. Um, Feeling Fixes, Mess and Emotion in Algorithmic Audits by Os Keys uh, and Jeannie Austin. Um, and yeah, I do know him. Uh, I was like, I feel like I know this person, sure do. <laughs> uh, it's a small field. And the basically what they're doing is they're talking about like auditing and you know, what does it do? What does it mean? What does it fix? Uh, and they are auditing this particular um, uh, this particular data set, uh, which is, Wow, I can't believe they did this. Um, so this is the HRT transgender data set uh, assembled by the uh, researchers at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, uh, consisting of over a million images of 38 people taken as frames from videos that have been uploaded to YouTube. Um, and it was uh, made available online. You just had to fill out a form. Um, and the subject matter were uh, 38 subjects who were transgender. Their videos, transition timelines, consisting of a series of video or single video, featuring a compilation of photographs or edited together from multiple recordings. <clears throat> demonstrating and narrating the physical and other changes that occurred over a period of 12 or more months on hormone replacement therapy. Um, it is absolutely wild <laughs> uh, that a researcher uh, thought it would be okay to just like collect this data and make it available. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, and as the uh, these two researchers go on to say, uh, Rickenex, sorry, I'm not entirely sure how to say that, at all's purpose was neither self-narration nor education. Instead, their goal was to allow facial recognition systems to consistently track people despite the physiological changes HRT often produces, uh, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, it was this that led them to creating and releasing the HRT transgender data set. Information about the data set was placed online in 2013, uh, produced several journal articles, uh, and an editorial describing novel challenges. Um, and the public felt somewhat less positive about the data set, and for good reason. So just a little background for those of you who may not be super aware of um, sort of the I'd say the global situation, but in particular the U.S. situation, um, certainly in the last couple of years, uh, but even before that, uh, where there is a lot of um, prejudice against transgender individuals, um, and uh, also especially recently a lot of um, legislation criminalizing being trans. Um, so there's been some legislation in um, 
Texas that uh, makes it, well, I don't know that it was legislation, I think it was guidance from the governor, but it has since been acted on. Um, making parents who are supporting their children who are transitioning uh, guilty of child abuse. Um, and it's a very, very bad time, right? So creating this sort of a, you know, without the permission of the data donors, <laughs> um, very, very, um, you know, uh, sensitive personal data in the data set. And of course we talked about facial um, images are, are bio, um, biometric, biometric. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for, a biometric, right? So they are, they are um, targetable to a human. Um, <laughs> uh, you just not a data set that A should have been collected, B should have been made publicly available, um, and C, the reputed purpose for it, um, sort of being able to more effectively surveil trans people uh, as they are they are undergoing, you know, physiological changes as a result of hormone replacement therapy, um, all extremely dangerous for trans folks. Very, very dangerous. And this was not participatory, right? Um <laughs> Anyway, uh, and the, the the situation in which these videos were uploaded was, you know, people sharing their own experience for other people in the community to be, you know, supportive. And this is secondary to use of their data. And also, you know, if I upload a YouTube video and later I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that and I take it down, you know, that's my right to, to take down that information. But if it's been, you know, uh, without my knowledge, scraped and included in an academic data set, I can't, I don't know about it and I can't do anything about it, right? So, issue, <laughs> big issue. Um, and basically the sort of, uh, the, the larger point of this this paper that I will uh, to pop into the chat is, um, you know, uh, th these, are, these are people <laughs> who you have just made a decision for. Um, I've talked a lot about on the channel how self-determination is a really big value for me and this robs the, data donors um, of their agency in this situation. Um, and also, you know, um, people knowing that you are trans is an individual decision that every trans person makes in every relationship that they're in, right? Um, and it can be dangerous to out people. Um, and I think this is, you know, clear, uh, a data set and a use case with clear malicious uses where the sort of initial use, I would say, is not particularly benign. Ugh. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Craig, just to just to clarify, they weren't looking to detect trans people. They were looking, um, you know, to tout people as trans specifically. Although I think that is a clear adversarial use of this data set. Um, the purpose of collecting the data set was to. Uh, continue to have a facial recognition system recognize trans individuals as they go through their transition, um, which I also not great. So, um, which, all of which is to say, just making data sets available and being clear about how they were collected is not an inherent good. Um, and you know, I come from I come from a you know an intellectual tradition that really values open science, that really values open data sets, um, and. I know that there's a big ethos of like, well, people put it online, so that's fine. I mean, yes, but I also think that people should continue to have control over their personal information even after it's been put online, right? Um, so anyway. Oh. Uh, and now <laughs> for a little bit of uh, topic whiplash, uh, this is, I believe, a preprint, but pretty interesting one. Um, Looking for a needle in a haystack, a comprehensive study of hallucinations in neural machine translation. So hallucinations is the term that the um, community is sort of centering on for the um, uh, quality of large language models in particular, that they will just insert information that was never there um, or say something that's untrue or add something additional that wasn't asked for. Um, and in the case of neural machine translation, when you're taking a um, text in one human language and translating it to another human language, um, machine translation as a task and sometimes confuse people a little bit you're not con you're not like converting human language into like you know a binary or anything although i guess you are because you're putting into a computer and it gets um 
there's a character encoding involved, but uh, it is translation of human languages. Um, <laughs> uh, Quark says, shouldn't data sets published on a sizable platform be regulated in some way? They aren't. <laughs> that's, uh, that's sort of the answer there. Um, if you are an EU citizen and you know your data has been used in a particular way, you do have some protections under GDPR. Um, you don't have that in the US. Um, but yeah, they just sort of aren't. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on and uh, how maybe US legislators are getting a little bit more wary around that. Who knows? Uh, AM says, uh, whose nation is in a thing an abstractive summarization too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so this is just a really good review study of, uh, well, it's not a it's not a review study. It is a study that reviews the topic um, about, you know, the thing. <laughs> um, and I think they had some like pretty good examples here. Um, so just sort of what this uh, looks like. Here is the example of the source sentence, which looks like is in German. Uh, here's the reference translation. And uh, the for this first example, the ideal translation, so these are done by humans, is the case where based on the pertinent system of regulations, a compromise is not possible is referred to as aporia. Uh, where the hallucination is, Aporia is the name of Aporia, which is the name of Aporia, right? So it's very repetitive, um, it's um, tautological and not in a useful way. Um, and, you know, clearly not a useful translation of this uh, original source sentence. Uh, and then in this example, uh, tickets for buses and subways are too expensive, uh, especially in Stockholm. Uh, and the hallucination is the hotel is located in the center of Stockholm, close to the train station. All of that information has just been pulled out of thin air. And it's because, you know, based on internet text, uh, usually when people are talking about these things, they're also talking about those things. So it's just been inserted. Um, and then finally, head up to the rooms, open up the windows and savor the view, breathe deeply, marvel. Uh, and the hallucination is the staff were very friendly and helpful, right? So here you're just sort of like having something that goes back and forth. Here you're having something that has very little overlap with the original sentence. Uh, and then here there's no overlap with the original sentence. But here's the thing. I don't speak German, and to me, this looks like a relatively reasonable translation. Um, I'd probably know that this means tickets for bus, <laughs> for buses. Although I might be like, well, I guess, you know, I guess ticket and bus is just a false cognate, and I don't know what those words actually mean. Stockholm, okay, there's Stockholm, that's there's Stockholm. That seems like an okay translation to me, because I don't speak the source language. Um, here, I may or may not notice <laughs> that this is a, an unhelpful translation, right? So um, just a, a helpful study for this particular type of error, particularly for neural machine translation. Uh, Craig says, can you explain in short how hallucinations come into play in abstractive uh, summarization? Am says, hallucinations come from the pre-trained part of the language model, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Basically, the so where it would come in with extractive summarization, there are two types of summarization, extractive and abstractive. Extractive means I look at the text, I pick out the relevant bits, and I just paste them together, right? So I'm removing a bunch of extraneous words, but everything that is in the summarized text comes directly from the original text. Abstractive means that I look at the original text and I create new text to summarize that content. Um, so it's during the creating of the new text that you can get hallucinations, right? So information that was never in the original paragraph or, um, you know, the sort of like repetitive thing. Um, so that's the, the sort of general idea there. And it's a little bit, I think, harder to detect differences between like strongly detached and fully detached that they're talking about here in neural machine translation because you... I have not worked a whole bunch in abstractive summarization. It's just sort of something I like know how to do and have done once or twice. Um, but often you won't have, you know, this clear reference translation of this is the good, perfect abstractive summarization that you want for a particular um, problem. So hopefully that helped. Um, uh, and 
Uh, yes, that is correct, AM. Uh, the, the hallucinations come from the model itself and not the target data, um, although they will be primed by the target data and other related texts that are similar to the target data in the original training set, which we don't have access to. Uh, and Nine Gaming says Elena Voita has more papers on hallucinations, on hallucinations in neural machine translation. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so the second author here is a good person to look up if you're interested in learning more about this topic. Uh, thank you. Yep. Uh, is it because of the data the model is pre-trained on? Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's happened to me when using a pre-trained T5 on CNN Daily Mail data set when the summary had text that was not there given in the input. Yep, absolutely. And again, that's just a quality of these models, right? Large language models are not designed to be grounded. They're not designed to be accurate. Um, they just sort of produce reasonable looking text. And sometimes enough of that reasonable looking text is useful for your ends that you can use it, but not always, and you can't count on it. Which is fine, like that's just what they were designed to do. I think there's been a lot of um, over-application of these systems. All right. Um, speaking of high quality data sets, this looks like it'll be a really good one. Um, so this is a multidisciplinary paper uh, and it is a really big uh, data set and also, I believe, a pre-trained model uh, specifically on legal arguments. And a lot of the annotators are lawyers and have that expertise. Um, so if you are interested in, uh, in legal work and, and NLP, I think this is going to be a really good resource for everyone. So I'll pop the link in the chat as well. Um, yeah. I. I would also say if you're interested in working in the legal domain and you are not a lawyer, find a lawyer to work with. <laughs> don't don't just uh, right. Like if you're interested in working in the medical domain and you are not a medical doctor, find a medical doctor to work with. Right. This is a, a rich area for collaboration and not one. Uh, neither of these are things that we should be going in and, you know, engineering around on without having a lot of deep knowledge about the context, uh, because the consequences are potentially dire. But looks like a really good resource. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe something to check out if you're working in this domain. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have a preprint from Jack Grieve, who uh, is, um, some of you may know that my sort of main focus in uh, my graduate work was in computational sociolinguistics. So using computational methods to ask sociolinguistic questions. Jack Grieve also works in that field. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see computational sociolinguistics in his bio there. Uh, and he is at uh, Birmingham, maybe? Where are you at, Jack? It doesn't say. Um, he teaches in the UK, or at least did last time I was <laughs> uh, last time I was checking. But he's from the US, so he mostly works on on the US. Um, and if any of you are colorblind, my apologies. Um, I'll try and show you with my mouse the sort of general places that people are. Can you see my mouse? You sure can't. Okay, well, I'll just try to describe it with words, give you a little uh, uh, vocal analysis. Um, and the the thing that they are doing is um, trying to uh, not describe general areas of the US based on um, the topics that are most frequently discussed on Twitter by people from there, right? So if you look at the west half, most of it is green and says rural, but along the coast, so near Seattle, um, you know, um, down to Portland and along the coast of California and a little bit into that state, which is, is that Arizona? I think that's Arizona and then New Mexico and then Texas. I'm pretty sure that's Arizona. Because that's Nevada, that's Utah, that, that's got to be Arizona. Yes, because that's Nebraska. Yes, uh, and a little bit of Arizona um, are uh, that's Nevada north of it, I'm pretty sure. U.S. Geography with me, Rachel, who's not great at U.S. Geography, um, are urban, as is the bottom half of Florida, uh, and then sort of New Jersey, uh, eastern Pennsylvania, up through, you know, parts of Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, um, 
the little ones, all them little ones up there, um, the sort of like Eastern seaboard. Sometimes people call that like the, the megalopolis. Um, they're just sort of connected, like, you know, Boston, New York, Baltimore, etc. cetera. Uh, and then uh, the sort of the swath, including, you know, most of the rest of Pennsylvania over to sort of the, the nowhere trough is also been what's this called, what's this called this is often called the nowhere trough in perceptual dialectology, where there's not a strong, um, certainly by outsiders, not a strong sense of, of place, um, which often includes the Dakotas and Missouri, sometimes Missouri. Um, and all of that is the Midwest. And then Texas and Oklahoma are Texas and Oklahoma. And if you know folks from Texas, they're from Texas, and that's what they will tell you, uh, usually. Uh, and then the sort of the bottom half of Virginia down across, excluding the bottom half of Florida, are all part of the Southeast, or as people from here would call it, the South. Um, yeah, so just sort of an interesting, uh, interesting distinction there. Interestingly, uh, Appalachia or Appalachia, uh, which includes parts of West Virginia, you know, the Blue Ridge, the Shenandoah Valley, that sort of thing. And then down into uh, North Carolina, a little bit of Tennessee, uh, a little bit of South Carolina and a little bit of Georgia, all that sort of Appalachian also gets grouped in with rural, as does the Northeast. <sighs> So, uh, just sort of interesting uh, emergent patterns in Twitter usage in the US. This sort of thing is, you know, linguists go wild for this. I'm very interested in this. Uh, Dana says, uh, oh, it is, <laughs> it is Arizona. Thank you. Hello, Noonbear. Welcome. Uh, why is Texas bundled, bundled with Oklahoma? Uh, yes, so it is uh, topical. Uh, so people in Oklahoma on Twitter tend to talk about the same sorts of things as they do in Texas. Um, yeah, uh, and just to describe the methodology, the basic idea is to infer the cultural regions based on regional differences in the topics people tend to discuss most frequently. Uh, <laughs> for example, the Midwestern region in orange, sort of in the middle upper half here, uh, is characterized by an inordinate amount of discussion of sports and that tracks. Uh, of course, these topics will differ across registers, but our view is that even if broad cultural regions are real, if broad cultural regions are real, they should generally be reflected across contexts in terms of variation in the topics people tend to discuss, even if these topics changed. Uh, I also think it's a great example of applied computational sociolinguistics as these methods were adapted from dialectology. These aren't dialect regions, but these are cultural regions that do closely align with certain modern theories of American dialects. Um, yeah. I'm guessing <laughs> that a big topic in the South is probably food and probably, I don't know, people talk about a lot about like church stuff down here, maybe. I don't know, I'm just guessing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, number one says, uh, my two cents, Twitter is a biased data set. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so every social media platform is gonna have particular biases. Twitter tends to bias towards professional millennials. Um, in general, uh, so people like me in my age bracket, very sociologically similar to me, um, you know, like uh, Reddit tends to be very heavily male um, and skews a little bit younger, um, which, you know, tends to buy a stuff trained on Reddit. Um, TikTok skews much younger. Um, so yeah, definitely. And also probably a little bit more urban because if you are out in a place where uh, data is expensive, uh, you're probably not gonna be watching a whole bunch of videos. Um, certainly not out and about. Yeah. <laughs> data says it's probably football. We love football in Texas. That has also been my impression. Um, and uh, I was going to say something and I'm just going to preface it by saying I know perfectly well this is not a documentary, but based on the documentary Friday Night Lights, not a documentary. Uh, and Noomber says, I think different biases in different cultural contexts. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so that is specifically in, in the US what the bias tends to be, but I know like it's very different in like Nigeria or Indonesia or different places. All right. So that's it for the research. Oh my God. <laughs> it's been an hour and we're like a quarter of the way through. Practical stuff. <sighs> Actually, you know what? No, I'm moving this one. I'm moving this one to the section uh, that it belongs in. Uh, we'll come back to that. 
Uh, all right, so this is um, a discussion by Kobus Grayling. He, he, y'all may or may not know him. He does a lot of sort of stuff and content around chatbots. Um, and this is sort of like his walking through of, um, you know, using dialogue GBT for conversational response generation and sort of what the process is kind of like. Um, yeah, and I thought it was just sort of generally interesting. Um, and I, you know, would be cautious about using this myself. I think it would be, you know, a nice warm start if you were working on a fun uh, side project or something where it didn't matter if you had hallucinations, right? We just talked about those. Um, it is going to produce them. Um, and in fact, that's what makes it useful, right? Because it's not just going to say what you said immediately back to you. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can do some tuning with your own information, uh, but I would perhaps not <laughs> put it out on uh, on a platform if I, you know, were in your shoes and you can tell that because I haven't done that. Uh, but if you're interested, um, this is sort of Cobus's uh, discussion of uh, his walkthrough. Um, you know, the output tends to seem well formed, right? It looks like a human wrote it. That's the benefit of large language models. Um, maintaining context throughout the conversation, which I was surprised to hear, but you know, um, it is a custom model. Um, you know, acting as a general Q and A chatbot. I would not trust the A's in this case, but some of the, like it'll be right sometimes, right? But it's hard to say on the face of it how often that sometimes is. Um, and I think, again, if you're using this for like a side project, uh, few shot training seems to be particularly helpful, which again, that's the benefit of a large language model. You have the, the you know, experience of all of the training data, so you shouldn't need as much training data to fine tune. So um, yeah. <laughs> uh, also, it's occasionally trollish, which uh, I guess that's up to you and your application, whether or not that's something you are willing to tolerate. So uh, yeah, just sort of an, an interesting walkthrough of the process and it is, you know, it's very fast, it's not a lot of code, anybody could do it, but is it going to produce something that's actually useful uh, in the context that you are using it in is a separate question. Uh, num <laughs> number one uh, says, fine-tuning is expensive on OpenAI, yeah. uh, and model weights are closed source. Yep, uh, a lot of stuff is closed source in this field, which I also don't necessarily think is a bad thing. Um, I also, I'm gonna be honest, I think we're spending, just as a field, way too much time on large language models. They are um, a novelty, they are kind of interesting. I think their actual practical applications are very limited and they are part of broader systems and there's much more work on like the idea that maybe you could replace the whole system with a large language model and in my experience practically it just doesn't work um, for anything that has to work, right? It can work for toys, which is great, uh, but you know, the proportion of uh, people who get played to <laughs> build toys uh, in, in NLP as opposed to people who get paid to do things that work for real um, in concrete applications is pretty small. So, uh, hey, hey. Uh, I have a question. I'm using R and Tidyverse on Kaggle and consistently run out of memory. Uh, is it because it's popular? Uh, does the cabin problem happen a lot or is it because of your code? I don't know. Um, it could potentially be because of your code. I'd have to take a look at it. Um, if you're interested in learning more about memory allocation in R, I'd recommend um, Advanced R, I think is the name of the book by Hadley. One sec, let me pull it up. I give you a link. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, uh, so you'll get a lot more information about sort of like how memory allocation works in R, and if you're interested in optimizing, that's um, a really good place to start. Um, also, I mean, it's been a while since I've used Kaggle, <laughs> uh, but I believe that they are selling more compute, so um, if it's something you're interested in paying for, I'm sure they take your money. Yeah. Uh, Craig says, <laughs> oh, I'm currently fine tuning GP2 theory because DaVinci is so expensive. Yeah, it is. Um, you can make things that work for real in your free time as an alternative to the commercial stuff like OpenAI. Yeah. Uh, I wish I knew how. Yeah, I mean, 
money is the answer. We'll talk about it a little bit later on, but that's the other thing, right? Large language models, they're large. They take a lot of data, they take a lot of compute, they take a lot of memory. They are just expensive, um, which also makes them less generally useful. All right. Uh, next up, so uh, we'll also talk about the Norm Core conference coming up. Uh, but Vicky Boykis is amazing. If you don't follow her on Twitter, I strongly recommend it. We've talked about her her newsletter before, uh, and I will pop this in the chat as well for y'all if you would like it. Um, but I uh, think that particularly for folks who are newer in the field or who are outside of tech, this sort of discussion is super, super helpful. Um, so basically the, the thing that she is discussing here is that, you know, when people talk about the algorithm or algorithms, particularly in a social media context, um, part of it is code. Yeah, for sure. But also a lot of it is decisions made by humans. Um, and the impacts of it are the impacts of human behavior as well as the automated system. So, um, oh yeah, here's the a, a link to the conference that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and as some backstory. It started out as a joke tweet and has now become a legitimate conference on norm core topics in data and machine learning. Uh, save the date. And if you're interested in sponsoring, shoot me an email. Yeah. If any of you work for companies that are trying to hire for machine learning, that might also be a good, good opportunity for y'all. Little, little hint. Um, yeah, so uh, just a, a really good sort of sociological discussion, and I think it would be a really helpful thing to share with people outside of tech in particular when they're like, who decides what I see on Instagram or Twitter or YouTube or TikTok or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Oh, so we talked on... Um, Tuesday in the malicious uses of text about astroturfing. And I just happened to come across an example this week. So I thought I'd uh, share it out. Um, so this is a, um, scoop, scoop, scoop. Uh, also, I do want to say just as a little bit of um, context for y'all who are not like knee deep in American politics, neck deep in American politics. Um, so this week, the uh, US passed and it's been signed into law. Um, well, the biggest climate legislation that has ever been passed anywhere in the world, as far as I'm aware, um, it is, I am, <laughs> I'm genuinely happy about it. Um, I feel like it's been kind of a doomy couple years, um, and I feel a little bit more hopeful now. So there's going to be a lot of investment in clean energy. There's going to be a lot of investment in electrification. Um, there's money for people to like replace gas water heaters and like appliances that, that use that there's you know um a lot of r d stuff a lot of sort of like getting local manufacturing in the us uh up uh modernizing the electric grid electrical chart ports um you know stipends for buying electric cars etc 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 um so it's really really going to be transformational for american climate policy um and we actually like have even the like slightest chance and like a really good chance of hitting our climate goals. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But in light of that really big legislation, and it was a squeaker. <laughs> there were, um, yeah, it was by no means a done deal that this was going to pass. There were a bunch of like, um, anyway, American politics, blah, 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 blah. I know some of y'all don't care about that. But um, in that sort of milieu of this like very, um, maybe it's going to pass, maybe it's not, really could have gone either way, big landmark legislation. Um, there was this nonprofit that was called United for Clean Power that was trying to argue that it was a, you know, a super bad thing. They were pushing ads to progressives. Um, so, you know, people who are very left on the political scale and would probably support a bill like this. Um, and uh, something that struck me in this discussion is, uh, you know, demand true environmental justice from your Democrat colleagues or pass the reconciliation bill. Um, and uh, the discussion here is that saying Democrat colleagues rather than Democratic is an effect affectation of GOP operatives, not climate activists. So yeah, I wouldn't call people Democrats <laughs> uh, in general. Um, so yeah, just a, an interesting sort of expose of astroturfing, right? So there's that um, that political strategy when you are pretending to make something look like it's grassroots, like it comes from, emergently comes from, um, you know, people trying to affect political change, but it's actually sponsored by a political party or organization for their own ends. So I'll have this in the chat as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Craig says something like distilled GPT-2 by Hugging Face works as fine resource-wise, uh, but we need to get the distilled GPT-3 version now. Yeah, and the, uh, the sort of the big challenge with language models is that we know how to make a full-size language model smaller. We don't know how to train a small language model that works as well as a big language model. And it's just sort of an open, unsolved question. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Cognition says there's so much in it. Yeah, there's a lot in the bill. And if you're in the US, I recommend, you know, you sort of look up an explainer or I think there's some like good YouTube videos that, like go through what's in the bill. And it's, I don't know. I think it's gonna genuinely help a lot of folks. Um, and yeah, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll have a future where the planet continues to be habitable. That's my hope. So uh, <laughs> what do you think about the American Lib Dems? Uh, I think they're a great party, uh, not, a, uh, not an actual party. Uh, I believe the Lib Dems are a British party. Um, All right. Uh, next up, uh, speaking of computing resources, um, if any of you are Latinx, so broadly come from uh, countries conquered by Spain, or I guess Spain uh, is also included in that, um, the Latinx and AI has set up a new supercomputer cluster. Oh my God, sorry. Let me uh, turn that off. <laughs> uh, I've been getting so many phone calls lately. Um, a new supercomputer cluster. So if you're looking for uh, computing resources and you're sort of in that broad group of folks, uh, I would check it out. Uh, Craig says, I've seen some large models with model cards on hugging face mentioning carbon emissions and some details. Uh, is that something people need to be adding to the model card? What's your take on it? That's a great question. I think it's something we should definitely consider. Um, and I mean, <laughs> The thing that frustrates me about this so much, sorry, you've you've triggered my trap card, is that folks will be like, well, you know, the carbon emissions are justified because everyone's going to use this model instead of building their own. So it's going to end up being a carbon savings. And then everyone builds their own. And they knew that they were going to do it. They were being disingenuous from the get-go to try and make themselves feel better or try to make other people who had reasonable objections feel better. And they were wrong. And they knew they were wrong. And they still said it and acted as if it were true. Drives me nuts. Um, yeah, I mean, I like small models um, and you know specialized language technology for the specific thing that you're trying to build. And for most people working in the field, that is just what is reasonable because, you know, yeah, sure. If you're in English, you've got BERT, you've got GPTX. Uh, but if you're working in like, you know, Kiswahili, you don't have that. You don't have those resources. Not everybody has the resources that are available for English. And if everybody did, it would be ungodly expensive. Um, and I don't think that it is a good or helpful direction for the, the field to go in as a whole. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, carbon footprints, I think carbon footprints aren't a precise indicator, hence not data set material. Yeah. Like, again, it's very hard to figure out, but the question is, you know, why did you think this was worth doing? And I think for a lot of people training large models, the answer is because the competition is doing it, because I want my number to be higher, because marketing, I want us to be higher on the leaderboard, and that's the answer. Uh, GPT-3 understands other languages in prompts. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Kind of, uh, right? Like sometimes it works for other languages kind of by accident, but not nearly as well as it works for English. Um, and I think there's also like a weird assumption. There's a weird assumption that I think is pretty unfounded that all languages could be mapped into a single vector space. Um, and I don't think that that is true, <laughs> practically. Um, I think that languages are so distinct and also the available texts in each language are so distinct that that's just not feasible, right? Even if it were theoretically possible, you know, on an infinitely large computer with an infinitely large data set, I don't think it's a real thing that can happen in the world that we're living in. Uh, and yeah, therefore I don't think we should be focusing on it. But, but at the same time, I'm very, um, cognizant of the fact that people who are especially working in situations with limited resources have limited resources and even like a lukewarm start start can be a really big benefit in that situation but yeah uh 
Uh, so there's an example in French with it looks like some. Uh, uh, I don't know if that um, issue is. Uh, oh yeah, no worries. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't know if that's an issue from GPT three or um, or Twitch that a bunch of characters in there with like um, uh, accents and etc. Uh, aren't working. <laughs> Le POS tagging. Uh, I don't know if that's an actual uh, direct uh, um, translation into English or not. I don't know what people would say in French. Is the thing. All right. Um, also, French is not a great example <laughs> uh, because a it's pretty linguistically related to English. B it's a fairly well resourced language. Um, and C I don't have a third point. Those are the the two big ones, right? Like if it worked really well for you know um, Kampangen or. Tagalog is also sort of, I would say, medium well resourced, but yeah, let's throw it in there. If it works equally well for Tagalog or Inuktitut or Cherokee, right, um, or Japanese, um, then I would potentially be more meh. Japanese is also pretty well resourced. Uh, Malay is also pretty well resourced. I'm just trying to think of like, uh, East Asian languages that are not that <laughs> they're not super well resourced that don't share a writing system with another uh, very well resourced language. So like all the various dialects of Chinese are usually written Mongolian. There we go. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the bot bugged. Yeah. Uh, data sets have a fair amount of uh, have a fair amount of French data. Yep. <laughs> resource is pretty well uh is pretty well reset uh hey old player uh do i think models like multilingual t5 or something we can try to use although not that accurate instead of just gpt3 uh just looking at it resource wise i mean i mean that's a practical question at some point right like you're trying to do something specific when you are working on an NLP project, right? You know what success looks like, hopefully. You know what failure looks like. Um, and you also know what sort of resources you have. You know your time, you know your budget, you know the amount of data that you have, and you know what other data you could possibly get. And given the specific constraints of a specific problem, I don't, I would say for most problems, large language models may provide a little bit of additional assistance, but are probably not going to be the core of the solution, right? Um, and that's because for most projects, you care about the text you output being accurate um, more than you do about it being fluent. So if I'm, you know, calling my bank and I'm using like a voice system to talk to my bank, I care more that the balance number they tell me is the correct balance number than I do that it's down stilted. Um, I care more that the amount of money I transfer is the correct amount of money to transfer and that the accounts that it's transferring to and from are the correct accounts than I do about, you know, it sounding a little bit robotic or the conversation being repetitive. And most NLP applications are in that situation where, yeah, okay, it would be nice if it sounded more fluent, but it's more important that it's accurate. Um, for some applications, that's not the case, right? So like GPT Dungeon, I think is a really good example of a good use of large language models, sort of raw. Uh, I know that there's like a lot of additional work that's been going on in GPT Dungeon, but that's sort of the general thing, right? Um, playing a storytelling game is fine. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the continuity breaks, right? Um, it doesn't matter if I pay the merchant $5 and they give me $10 back. Um, right the the stakes are low and i can still have an enjoyable time even if the information that i'm being told is wrong but you know if i'm scheduling an appointment with my doctor's office um I, the time needs to be right the specialist i'm meeting with needs to be right knowing whether or not they take my insurance needs to be correct particularly in the us so yeah um and if language models can get you to an accurate system a little bit faster i don't think there's any reason not to use them as long as they fit in with the, the other constraints of your project but i think that the big danger there is that you waste a lot of time trying to you know squeeze this wild and really unpredictable thing into a box and it never fits uh, when instead you could have been building a different box 
and filling it with things that were custom built for that box, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and like if it helps, it helps. And I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying that likely I would use it as like a fourth resort if I'm like, oh, if I only had a little bit more X or if I had like uh, a Y that was a little bit more fluent sounding or something. Yep. Uh, uh, Nine Gaming says there's been some hype around 8-bit Maltrix, ma Maltrix matrix multiplication for transformers, making large transformer-based models more accessible on consumer GPUs. Yeah, but I mean, I have a lot of access to, uh, you know, I could just order a bunch of uncut gemstones online and I might be excited when they got here and I might be like, look at all these uncut gemstones I have. And I might, you know, take a picture and tag my friends in it. But uh, I don't actually have a use for uncut gemstones um, <laughs> in my life. I don't have anything particular that I actually need them for. So unless you are a jeweler and you, well, I guess not even a jeweler, you could use uncut gemstones if you were a jeweler, but unless you're like a lapidarist and you can cut gemstones, um, they're not super useful as an analogy. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, speaking of AI hype, uh, so just a, a quick discussion from Emily Bender about a particular um, uh, thing she was reading. Uh, and she, you know, in this section it says, oh, AI can do so many things. You know, it can design proteins, it can write code. We just talked about how the writing code is, you know, potentially an issue. Uh, solve puzzles, solving puzzles, perfectly fine. Please build all the puzzle solving AIs you want. I don't think that's an issue. Um, model people's states of mind. Um, and like, as you can see going through this list, I already have some issues, but this one in particular, it can't do. Um, and uh, so she's like, okay, well, I'm gonna check out the preprint that they're talking of about, um, which, you know, in scholarly literature, preprints have not undergone peer review, so you have to peer review it yourself. And unless you are an expert in the thing the preprint is talking about, you're probably not gonna do a very good job. Uh, I mean, I. You know, I've definitely talked about some preprints today that I cannot tell you if they are correct or not, but they look interesting. Um, and in the preprint itself, they're not claiming that, right? Uh, they're looking at whether BERT could be fine-tuned to replicate human annotations as to whether sentences expressed set taking somebody else's perspective or not. That's not modeling mental state. The lesson, as usual, don't believe the hype. If a sentence starts with AI can, always ask, what is the task that is underlying the claim? What is the input? What is the output? How is the system evaluated? Which I think is a uh, great discussion. <laughs> uh, add 100 social credits and give me my current score. Uh, response, too long. <sighs> um, so also in practical, don't buy these. Don't buy these, don't let your friends buy these, don't let your family buy these, please don't do this, holy crap. Um, so Facebook announced this a while ago um, and they are glasses uh, that have cameras in them that send uh, everything that they're looking at to Facebook, basically. Um, and uh, a big problem with them is that if you are around somebody who is wearing them, A, you're gonna have to notice like the little little camera bits right here, which are not very big. Um, you may absolutely be recorded without your consent, which in many states in the US is illegal. Um, and the indication that it's recording is this little uh, white light up here that you can't see in daylight. Um, so yeah, uh, horrible. Don't use these. Don't, <laughs> please, please don't let anyone you know use them. I'll just post the link here. You can share it out. Um, yeah, they basically are like the, the Snapchat glasses. They're like, well, you know how sometimes you're out in the world and you just wish that everything you saw, like the special moments were being recorded, right? Um, <laughs> it's... Yes. Um, also, if you are trying to use them, um, it's all of the information that is collected is associated with your Facebook account. And also a lot of additional information is collected like health and fitness, purchases, finances, locations, contracts, search history, sensitive data, and more. So um, yeah, just absolutely uh, no reason to use these um, 
not really much reason to believe that Facebook will continue to support them long term and you will be sharing your data in a and other people's data without their consent uh, in an extremely invasive way. So please just know. <laughs> Cognition says, surveil everyone you encounter for the profit of Facebook and look cool doing it. Uh, uh, number one says, they're a tool to enlarge uh, Facebook slash Meta's already huge data sets. Oh yes, absolutely, 100%. Uh, basically a walking IRL data crawler. Yep, so um, don't. <laughs> uh, and please feel free to use this resource to suggest to other people, also don't. Um, and uh, I mentioned the Norm Tort, Norm Core Tech Conference uh, that Vicky Boykis et al. are putting on. Um, so it should be a fun time. <laughs> It'll be perfect for the I have nothing to hide dummies. Um, yes, I have nothing to hide is exactly the same as I want everything that I do to be public. Anyway. Um, yeah, so... Uh, It'll cover uh, machine learning and NLP um, as part of machine learning, I guess, and uh, middle brow ML topics is how she described it. How to secure Python packages 2022. How many K folds is too many? How to make the browser pop up come up when notebooks are done running? Putting features in Postgres, etc. So, should be a lot of really useful stuff. Vicky is great. I have um, every belief that this is going to be a great conference that we're probably all going to want to go to and it's online so we can so december 15th mark your calendars also if any of y'all are or know uh some african women uh this uh looks like potentially a useful educational resource uh and they have a couple of different programs including one in machine learning yeah so they've got one in ai one in machine learning not entirely sure why those are different um vr and ar and then cloud computing so i think this might be you know a useful research if you know somebody in that group who is looking for some free online learning materials uh, yeah and you get uh, a certificate of completion which is nice all right uh, if any of you are JavaScript devs, and I know you are, uh, this is a um, library for uh, JavaScript NLP stuff. Uh, it looks like it might be in need of like a little bit of extra polish, but it could be uh, potentially a helpful tool. So I will uh, post that in the chat as well. Uh, and then... <laughs> Uh, and this is compromise.cool uh, um, if you're looking for a little bit of help. Uh, yeah, it is going to be online. <laughs> uh, number one says, please, African people, unbias our data sets. I mean, I think it is, you know, more important that uh, as machine learning technology is being um, put into production in Africa that it is built by the people who need it uh, and that there is uh, self-determination from those communities. And also, there is a huge tech community in Africa. Um, I'm sure some of y'all are, are from there um, and, you know, very, very vibrant, growing very quickly, um, lots of companies being formed, etc. So um, hopefully should also be work available in the field. All right. And speaking of language technology in Africa, I'll pop this in the, oops, no, go away, come back. Uh, I'll pop this in the chat as well. Uh, and then I also put this in a um, in a playlist on my channel. I'm gonna try and put together, uh, you know, a lot of uh, cool videos as I come across them. Uh, and this is a discussion by uh, Isaac Manzi and Kelia Mugenza. McKenzie, um, who are talking about their work building language technology for uh, Kenya Rwanda, um, including machine translation, text-to-speech, and automatic speech recognition, or ASR. So um, if you are interested in, you know, this topic uh, or just sort of like what it's like to work on, on a language like this, I think this should be a really uh, interesting discussion to tune into. Uh, and then, uh, you know, this is talking about Dolly 2, but I think it's going to be very relevant as, you know, more and more things come out. Uh, this is uh, sort of a discussion about, you know, 
Dolly 2. Um, it's being commercialized, of course. Um, for those of you who don't know the, the history of OpenAI, it was founded as like a nonprofit, and now I think it's limited profit, um, is how it's described, which I'm, they're, they're out to make money, right? <laughs> uh, they said they weren't, but they are now. Uh, and as a result, a lot of the research that they're doing, they're commercializing and charging for. Uh, number one says stable diffusion for the win. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but it's going to continue to be a thing. And what does this mean for people who currently make their living doing the sort of work that these type of models do? Um, Hector, hey, good to see you. It's been a while. Um, and, uh, oh, right. <laughs> I don't have all my, uh, my add-ons on this, um, but it's sort of a discussion about, um, you know, what it means for creatives and, you know, can they survive the, the oncoming robot apocalypse? Um, and just as like a nice counterpoint, <laughs> uh, to this, uh, there is, uh, an artist who tweeted yesterday, uh, that, um, he question mark. Um, I'm, I'm going to say he, if that is incorrect, um, apologies. Uh, I recently had a last minute gig come in, a uh, client was running behind because pff, things hadn't worked out with the previous artist. The previous artist was Dolly. Um, so basically a commercial client that was trying to use, uh, uh, you know, AI for this and it just didn't work. So they ended up contracting with a human. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't think that, um, you know, automated art is going to replace human creatives at all in any way. I'm somebody who, you know, um, very much enjoys visual arts and performing arts in, in my life and also someone who is perfectly willing to pay humans to do that. And I know that I am not alone in that. So, <laughs> uh, number one says, uh, they got 2 billion and it kind of shifted the purpose of the project. Hmm. There's somebody we don't talk about on this channel, but know that this face is in relation to that person. <laughs> uh, also, uh, speaking of, you know, inclusive models and, uh, you know, especially different languages, if you are interested in doing uh, <laughs> work on uh, Common Voice, which is a Mozilla, I believe it's a Mozilla Foundation project at this point, um, designed to increase diversity in data sets. And this is a situation where I think it is actually warranted um, and the current cur cur collection and creation is being done and annotation is being done very carefully. Um, I'm, you know, uh, I think the Common Voice project is doing a pretty good job. Uh, they also have a competition coming up uh, with a $200,000 $20,000 prize pot, sorry. <laughs> People shouldn't put zeros on things, it's confusing. Um, so if you are you are interested in working in these uh, these areas and uh, also maybe making a little bit of money, uh, check it out. <laughs> he put Dolly out of a job. Um, robots don't have jobs. Uh, and also speaking of systems that don't work great, so this is a... Uh, <laughs> and also the people we don't talk about on this channel. Uh, this is a really good example of a um, system just not having the ability to handle a class it hasn't seen. Um, so this is a horse-drawn carriage. Um, and as you can see, the sort of modeling of what that is is changing dramatically. And none of these things are horse-drawn carriages, right? Like it's a truck. It's a truck facing forward. It's a truck facing backwards. It's a car. It's a person walking on the road, um, none of which are right. Um, and, you know, in some situations, it's okay not to spend a lot of time and worry on very rare edge cases. Uh, cars are not one of those situations because those edge cases kill people. Um, and that's my thought on that. Moving on. To jobs. Uh, well, I'm just going to pop this in. <laughs> uh, I haven't messed with cookies on this one. Uh... So this is at uh, Chevening. It's at the British Library. Um, and it is specifically for folks from, I think, Senegal, Niger, Nigeria, and Mali, I want to say. Um, so if you are interested in working with uh, West African manuscripts and no Arabic script, uh, this might be a cool, cool position to look into. 
Uh, there's also an assistant professorship at Cambridge in ethics, AI, data, and algorithms. Uh, however, it is fixed term, um, which basically means that it's a contract job and it will go away, but they still, I am positive, expect you to relocate to Cambridge. So um, if you are really interested in working at Cambridge, maybe reasonable to look into. Um, probably not going to be, you know, a long-term career for anybody, but could be a nice position for a little bit, particularly if you're already in the UK. Uh, and also, uh, Ginger is a hiring a, a staff machine learning engineer in NLP, if any of you have been in the field for a while. Uh, and we talked last week quite a bit about, two weeks ago, I guess, um, mental health and machine learning. And Ginger, I think, is a company that's doing a pretty good job with that. Uh, they were acquired by Headspace sort of recently, and um, they uh, provide online, you know, therapy and counseling um, from humans and the chatbots are designed to sort of like scale the, the work process of the humans. Um, and also I've read their privacy policy fairly recently, a couple months ago, and uh, looked pretty good to me. Um, and I believe this is also going to be on Will Kern's team and he's a fabulous engineer um, and a chill dude. So yeah, could be a good uh, opportunity as well. And with that, politics. <sighs> Wow, I wish I had water. <laughs> Actually, wait, I have a I have a screen for this. I'm gonna go get water. I'll be back in just a sec. I'm back. Hello. All right. Uh, my dog found a new spot to be in and he's really enjoying it. Politics. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, we'll start with this. So this is uh, an event that's going to be in London. So if any of you are in London and interested in uh, radical narratives about artificial intelligence and its supersession, uh, and resisting AI in general, this might be something that is interesting to look into. Um, so yeah, I don't know if any of you are in London. Uh, I believe this is going to be an in-person event. Uh, also, oh, so we've been talking quite a bit on the channel recently about data brokers, right? So. In the US, data brokers can basically buy anybody's data from anybody who wants to sell it, um, and they can sell it to pretty much anybody they want to, including law enforcement. And the reason that this is an issue is because in the United States, we have constitutional protection against unreasonable search and seizure, right? Um, and if I, you know, which means that, right, the police can't come just knock on my door and be like, hey, we want to know everything that's in your fridge. I can be like, no, goodbye, and just close the door and that's fine, uh, unless they have a warrant. Um, however, <laughs> they can buy from Samsung the information about everything that's in my fridge um, without getting a warrant. Um, and basically, we're starting to see maybe some hints that US legislatures um, are actually not happy about that uh, and are maybe going to start doing something, which would be great. Um, so seven agencies were asked to provide Congress with records about their purchases of private data, which they have been doing um, and will continue to do until such time as it is illegal and maybe even past that. Who knows? Uh, number one says, what about in the UK since Brexit? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I am less familiar with EU uh, data privacy laws. Um, Question mark. Yeah, it would be cool cognition. I'd love to see some action on this. Uh, and if we could have our constitutional rights back, please and thank you. All right. Um, also, so this is a, uh, uh, it's a research article, but it's a law article. So I put it in politics instead and I'll pop this in the chat as well. So um, this is quite the position paper. Uh, and basically what they're saying here is like, yeah, okay, everybody wants to de-bias it and say like, oh, our system's biased. Um, and actually we think that these systems are directly discriminatory. Um, 
And we illustrate how certain forms of algorithmic bias and frequently deployed algorithms might con constitute direct discrimination and explore the ramifications, both in practical terms and the broader challenges automated decision-making systems pose to the conceptual apparatus of anti-discrimination law. Um, so basically they're saying like, hey, a lot of these systems are straight up discriminating. What do we do about that legally? Uh, so if you're interested in law, uh, I think it would be a good thing to do. Uh, Everyone says, I think they maybe had time to implement GDPR before leaving. I hope for them. Hmm. I do too, but um, I don't think that they did. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they didn't. I could be wrong. Um, I mean, the US government is not like deeply functional, but right now I would say it's a little bit more functional than the UK government. All right. Uh, and then this thread, I think, is uh, pretty interesting. So uh, Jack Clark is um, at Anthropic, which is a opening eye spinoff. So I'll let you uh, <laughs> figure out how you feel about that. Um, but this is sort of his discussion uh, or thoughts about AI policy. Uh, I'm gonna pop that in the chat. Uh, and I think the one thing that is particularly um, do, 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 do. Sorry, I just get rid of the, that one. Uh, one thing that is uh, particularly um, relevant in this thread is this, uh, like 95% of the immediate problems of AR policy are just who has power under capitalism and you literally can't do anything about it. <laughs> AI costs money, companies have money, therefore companies build AI. Most talk about democratization is PR friendly, yes, but ignores this which I think dovetails really well with a lot of discussions we've had today of people being like, well, I'm trying to get the system to work for my situation, but it just doesn't and I can't afford it. Um, yep. Anyway, uh, I think it is uh, an interesting thread if you are interested in this sort of thing. Uh, and then uh, some stories from uh, our favorite news source, rest of the world, well, one of my favorite news sources. I think that they are they are way up there. Top three, top three favorite news sources. Um, the other two are just local here to Virginia. Uh, and um, uh, this is a story about basically how a gay dating app in China had to change to be able to stay open uh, because of increasing persecution of um, queer folks in China um, and organizations that, you know, um, support them, right? Uh, and this is, you know, uh, a very <laughs> uh, grim read uh but sort of talks about how sites are rebranding and changing what they offer in order to continue to stay open in this situation of um you know pretty pretty aggressive oppression so yep uh anyway i'll uh post this link in the chat if any of you are interested uh number one says i don't agree with the gentleman's statement on twitter hmm. I think that's fair. Um, I think that I don't like democratization for the same reason that I don't like debiasing because it doesn't address harms, um, right? Like, I don't have access to nuclear bombs does not mean it's not the problem with nuclear bombs, right? I'm not saying that AI is a nuclear bomb by any stretch of the imagination in terms of the harm that it can do, but I do think that, you know, it's a clear parallel, right? So wide access to a technology is not necessarily inherently the biggest problem with that technology if what the te that technology does is not beneficial to everyone. Does that make sense? Like water purification, the issue with water purification is that not everyone has access to it. It is not, you know, I'm trying to think of a related thing with water purification. I guess the other big issue with water purification is uh, cybersecurity and how easy it is to ransomware it um, in, in other sort of grim news. Um, also in Indonesia, uh, uh, some projects are uh, ORN and some are still open. I'm not entirely sure I know what you mean by ORN. 
Yes. And I mean, also consider the source. <laughs> um, but I think it does speak to the the issue with a lot of AI ethics stuff, which is that the issue is that the system exists in this society um, and not inherently a technical issue, if that makes sense. Um, even six O are born and still. Oh, okay. So you're saying like some projects can, were created to be open and continue to be open. Um, yes, no, I would agree. Uh, yeah, so any of you who are, you know, working on tech in Indonesia, uh, this is, I think, probably the most stringent, uh, you know, content moderation legislation. I'm not an expert. I just sort of keep an eye on it. Uh, I've seen outside, uh, uh from a democracy, um, yeah, so uh, the potential new uh, legislation or laws will be that platforms have four hours to take down content or face fines as much as $33,000 per violation. Um, you know, and if you're working at like Twitter and there's, you know, 100,000 posts a day or more, that's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, even if just a sliver of those, um, you know, are found to be in violation. Uh, so yeah, very, very stringent content regulation. Um, and uh, yes, potentially has a lot of uh, harm that it can do to users. And I think that's probably what's going to happen as a result of this is that um, companies are going to, you know, super overreact and are, you know, going to remove user content at the, the merest hint or whisper or may just close down their service in the country entirely. So. Yep. Anyway, moving on. Speaking of the UK, so Privacy International, which is an organization um, that is international that looks at tech privacy, um, is filing complaints uh, against uh, the uh, organizations in the UK that are tagging migrants with GPS um, for fine grain long-term surveillance. Um, and that's horrifying. I didn't know that was happening um, in the UK. Uh, there's something similar happening in the US, which uh, I'm also very upset about. Um, yeah, so they're basically they're ankle tagging migrants and um, monitoring their precise location all the time. Um, which is, uh, I would say, a pretty, a pretty big human rights violation. I mean, I don't know if I consider privacy a human right. So yeah. And boop. All right. Uh, sorry, just removing somebody. Uh, yep. Not great. Uh, really glad that this organization is tackling this, and I hope uh, they stop doing that soon. Uh, all right. Also on the sort of general topic of uh, what we talked about on Tuesday. So uh, this is uh, conspirator, nor conspirador Norteño is a uh, privacy and disinformation researcher, not privacy, disinformation researcher. Um, and uh, they put together a uh, sort of investigation of a couple accounts on Twitter that use uh, generated faces as profile faces. Um, and I mean, just looking at these, a lot of these faces, I don't know that I necessarily would be able to pick them all out as being computer generated. Um, this one for sure, that's that's nothing. <laughs> um, and in some of them, you know, a woman is wearing one earring and not the other, which is, you know, a towel you can use sometimes. Um, and then of course, all the eyes are aligned in a way that is, um, you know, uh, a uh, trademark of this particular sort of, of thing. Um, and all of these accounts are involved in uh, different types of political, you know, activism and, you know, misinformation spreading. Um, and we talked a little bit on Tuesday about, you know, text generation as part of this process. And I don't have any, um, any information about whether or not text generation or automated text generation is part of this process. Um, but 
it is not too far of a stretch to think that it could be. And it's just like, do we have the text generation detector that's uh, relevant for each of these? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and it could just very well be a person, right? Um, it could very well be human labor as well. So, yep, astroturfing again, definitely. Um, uh, generative machine learning, generate faces, yeah. Um, so I believe these in particular were done by GAN, uh, generative adversarial networks. Um, yeah, and I'll pop the link in this chat if you wanna read the thread, it's, you know, uh, I was talking about it and I think it's nice to have some concrete examples of this particular type of thing happening in the world. Uh, Cognition says, seeing a lot of these uh, make me suspicious of any photo of someone with eyes in that specific spot. I think that that is very reasonable. Uh, <laughs> it's like a new uncanny valley. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, they're not, these are not pictures of real people, right? These are all fake generated pictures. Bye, AM. Thanks for joining. Um, yep. And, and astroturfing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, good account to follow if you're interested in sort of what's up with misinformation and disinformation and other sort of like exposés on something like this. Um, sometimes stuff on the internet is fake. All right, ethics. Um, and we're gonna start it off with just like a bam, 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 bam of what the heck were you thinking? Like, I know what you were thinking. Um, and just some uh, things that people have done recently that uh, I would not have done. Um, and then says, will diffusion models replace GANs? I have no idea. Um, I will say that I personally don't work in computer vision and kind of have no interest in it. So no idea, no opinion, no knowledge. What's my opinion on quantum computing? Meh. <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm not interested in computing for its own sake. I am interested in it as a tool. At the point when it becomes a useful tool, I'll probably get interested. All right. So first of all, Blunderbot, um, so this is probably not news to most of you, but open-ended tat bots trained on internet text are a bad idea and say horrible things. So what has Meta done? Released an open-ended chatbot trained on internet text. Um, te toy pono. Um, and of course, like if you try to talk with it, they're like, hey, it's gonna say wrong things. It's gonna blah, 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 blah. And we talked about this a little bit on Tuesday, right? Um, that people are immediately misinterpreting the output of the chatbot as representing of some sort of a mental internal state. It is not. And they are folding in user data. I'm, anyway, why did they do this? Like, I know why they did it. It's creating a lot of like conversation. Um, and like, I've got a lot of issues with Lambda and Google, but they never like put it on the internet and were like, have at it, let's see what it does. Oh, it was racist, like, who could have suspected that? Um, but Meta did it. Uh, in other things that, oh, gee, I'm gonna cricket. We talked about this, right? Um, so uh, stable diffusion, uh, is gonna be public and they're just like, we're doing it. Uh, and the big difference, one of the big differences between Stable Diffusion and Dolly is that the Dolly 2 work in particular had a lot of built-in protections against generating, you know, um, images of specific people or, um, you know, uh, violent content or explicitly sexual content. Um, Stable Diffusion doesn't, that they're putting it out there and making it available. Also on this film, <laughs> uh, Alpha, opt.alpha.ai, which I'm sure is a startup trying to generate buzz. Um, not true of Meta, but also true of the Stable Diffusion folks, I'm sure. Um, they're like, hey, anybody can have a GPT-3-like experience for free. Uh, we've put no safety measures in place. We're just doing it. We're just doing it. We're just telling people about it because we would love some attention, please. Um, also, you can host your own, so that's great. Um, and, oh, uh, one sec, it looks like I'm missing something. Nope. Is it this one? Nope, all right, well, anyway, um, that's the wrong link. 
that's the wrong link. Uh, another thing that they have uh, started to do recently is that TikTok, I don't have the link for it right here, but I guess trust me that I did. Uh, TikTok has added a uh, text to image filter as part of their like base app functionality. Also don't install TikTok. It is um, a privacy nightmare. Don't do it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there are, again, no safeguards against producing, like it doesn't work very well, it doesn't look good, um, but you know, you can absolutely feed it, um, you know, um, prompts that I would call irresponsible. So, yep, we're, we're Werner from Browning it, up and down and all around, and that's where the field is right now, and I'm not surprised, but I am disappointed. <laughs> Dino says, such an unassuming face, such a horrible bot. Yep. Look at me, I'm harmless. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, at least it's not a human face, right? Um, that is one of the things with, with Tay was that it looked human, like the little avatar, which um, I don't recommend in general. So, uh, Nine says, diffusion models are now being used for generating audio, text, and images. I haven't looked into them much. Uh, maybe I should. Oh, one sec, let me, oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Nero, that got caught by, uh, uh, <laughs> got caught by my filters. Um, just assume that in order to make a great model, they do filter input to the training data for, uh, so, oh yeah, number one is saying that they're, uh, uh, they just didn't filter stuff, yep. So, that's what's up. Um, also sort of on the, the ethics discussion, this is something I've seen a lot, uh, and I saw it again online recently, and I will just, uh, you know, share this. Um, number one says, they plan to release the model in weights that are runnable on most consumer GPUs. Yeah, I know. And like... It's frustrating. It's very frustrating to me. Um, and specifically for the reasons that we talked about on Tuesday, like all of the malicious use cases that it will enable and they just don't care. And there's no, like, I can't make people care about things, right? And that's, even if I could, I wouldn't, right? I like, I, I would not choose to change people's internal state, um, even if I had the ability, because I think that would be deeply unethical. But it's just, it's so disappointing. Like it could, it, it's so disappointing. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, we should probably just not describe models as being equivalent to uh, disabled folks, in particular um, blind and deafblind people, uh, because uh, models are models and people are people and uh, equating the abilities of people with the abilities of computer models is dehumanizing for those people. So maybe we should probably just not do it. Something to keep in mind. <sighs> Number one says, wait and see, your moral compass is not theirs. Yeah, clearly, <laughs> very, very clearly. Um, I guess my personal willingness to make the world worse for my personal gain is very low. And I don't know if charitably, People may believe that there is no way that their models could do harm or that the benefit of the models far outweighs any potential harm. Practically, I don't think that's been borne out in the past. And I don't think we're ready <laughs> as a field to mitigate these risks. Um, and I think that the potential for wide scale automation and scaling that makes foundational experiences untenable is enormous. And that's not a risk that I would take, but it's a risk that other people are taking on our behalf. And uh, yeah, <laughs> did Photoshop ruin the world? Um, I think there is, 
a big difference. Right, like, we've always had image editing, right? Like, you know, let's look at the last two decades. We've always had image editing. We've always had the ability for people to write lies online. Um, it is not the existence of the thing, it is the scalability of the thing. Um, and I would say that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that there has been really big psychological harm to individuals because of things like Photoshop. Um, there's, uh, you know, in the, the sort of the psychology literature, there have been a lot of studies on the long-term effects of seeing, uh, particularly on young girls, of seeing mostly, um, you know, face-tuned faces, right? Of seeing themselves mostly with filters. Um, and it's creating body dysmorphia, right? It's creating the idea that you don't look the way you actually look, that your impression of what your body is like is different from what your body is like um, in a way that, and like th there's different reasons why that can occur, but specifically that you don't look correct unless you are wearing makeup. You don't look correct unless your own face has been photosh photoshopped. I would say that's a, that's a genuine harm that's been done to children. Um, and I'm not a fan of that. And like, I'm not saying that's Photoshop specifically. I think that that's more, more filters and sort of like a lot of the, the automated stuff there, but ugh. yeah, I don't know. It's when people are moving fast and breaking things, it's very rarely their own things they're breaking. And that just doesn't sit right with me. And, um, that's where I am. Uh, Brett says, uh, Adobe was, is very anti-competitive. -com Macromedia was taken over for a color wheel. Hmm, I didn't know that. Oh, is that why there's no color wheel in The Sims 4? Is it so they didn't get sued by Adobe? Uh, that would be hilarious. Um, it's just democratizing access to certain skills. Uh, that's an education problem, not the responsibility of Photoshoppers. I mean... Again, like we all have different ethical compasses, but I would say that if you are making money from selling people guns, then you have some moral culpability for the harm that is done with those guns. And that's just like my stance as an engineer, right? Like if I intentionally build something with a clear malicious use and it is used for that malicious use, then that's on me. Um, and I think that's a responsibility that is clear in most engineering fields, but is not in software engineering specifically. Um, and like, we want all the responsibilities and like, well, I don't know that we want all the responsibilities. We want all the respect. <laughs> uh, we want respect. We want like the high salaries. We want the perks, but we don't necessarily want the actual responsibility um, that like real engineers do um, or have. Like we don't have legally a response, a duty of care towards our users, but I think that morally and ethically we do uh, and not just our users but the people who are affected by those users and again that's you know my stance and I, I don't think that's not supported legally certainly in the united states but <sighs> yep if you you know uh yeah, anyway, I don't want to get too, uh, <laughs> too sidetracked. Um, I'm biased. I mean, yeah, everyone's biased. Everyone has their own biases. Everyone, you know, you, you look at the world through your own lens of experiences, right? And um, part of the lens of my experiences is that I and people that I love have been, like, hurt very badly by other people's technical decisions. Um, and it's not good <laughs> uh, and it's not great and um, those decisions take individual you know autonomy and agency and self-determination away from people um, and also like decisions are being made at a societal level by individual corporations for their profit um, and like this is beyond the realm of just like language models um, I think that we have some responsibility to the other people that we share the world with um, so Anyway, uh, humans were built on free will. I mean, cool. Uh, I think that we all have the right to exercise it within our domain, within our own like sphere of influence, but not necessarily for other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, anyway, 
I like, I think it's good to have a discussion uh, and figure out where you come down on this, but um, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> with great, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. We've got a lot of power, but uh, I think a lot of uh, folks in the field are just sort of denying their responsibility. Case in point. Uh, so anyway, this is a, um, an article about how uh, Facebook is not just not banning white supremacists, it is making money off of them, right? And it's like, deplatforming works. Deplatforming works to um, protect society when the things that are deplatformed are things that are, you know, antithetical to the continued existence of a free society like white supremacy. So. Nine Gaming says, everyone, everything's good until something bad happens to us. Yeah, and yeah. I like I I hope nothing bad happens to any of us. <laughs> That's my goals, but yeah. Uh yeah, and here's the thing, like, people are not just handing people tools, people are benefiting from handing people tools, right? So uh, if I am benefiting from serving the content of white supremacists, I am incentivized to continue serving that content. Um, and I think there's, you know, Facebook keeps doing it, right? Like, it's a clear evil thing to do, right? This is like IBM in the, you know, in the 30s levels of evil, but they keep doing it. Anyway. Uh, if you have opinions on fairness <laughs> and would like to get paid for them, uh, maybe do this study. Um, so yeah, this is a study on uh, fairness in machine learning system evaluations. I'll post the link. Uh, it is paid, and if you are interested, uh, check it out. Uh, and it will be a $25 gift card. So um, researchers from Microsoft Research and Northwestern, it'll almost certainly be uh, be published. Um, I know Hannah, she does good work. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, I would uh, check it out. Uh, Brett says, it might seem good, but could be dangerous. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> Just to be very blunt, <laughs> uh, people who currently have jobs in, in tech and software engineering uh, are probably not going to be the people that are most hurt by these systems, right? It's going to be um, poor folks. It's going to be hourly workers. It's going to be children. It's going to be, um, you know, people who are minoritized in other ways, people who don't have power and money. Um, and I, again, I think we have a responsibility towards the people in our society who are you know, hurt by that society. And I personally want to live in the type of world where everybody looks out for everybody else. Um, and if you don't, then, I mean, that's your prerogative. I'm still going to look out for you because that's this type of place I want to be. Uh, that's where I want to be. And that's, you know, what I want to leave behind is a, a more caring, compassionate world where we have, you know, responsibility to each other and we take it seriously. But anyway. Uh, as I say at the beginning of my videos, this channel is for people who care about language technology and other people. And if you don't care about either of those things, you're probably going to be frustrated uh, watching my stuff. Yep. Uh, isn't the ad revenue system one of the main culprits for most companies? Yeah, that's a good question. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, I hope you find it interesting, Docking. Um, not necessarily inherently, right? Like, I think some of the companies that I am... I, I'm sure here you're referring to the, the Facebook. Um, he's so loud. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about my dog. He's just sort of romping around. I'm sure you can hear him in the background. Um, I think for Facebook, right, that's how they make money. Um, you can imagine many different ways where Facebook makes money, right? So Facebook could make money by being a utility. Um, Facebook could be publicly owned. Facebook could be a nonprofit. Facebook could make money with user subscriptions. You might get like additional features if you pay for it. Uh, Facebook could make money uh, mainly through the marketplace, right? They could be like uh, just sort of like a Craigslist thing. Um, I don't even know how Craigslist makes money. Um, Facebook could make money by, you know, selling you extra emotes and reactions, right? There are many different monetization models. They've chosen an ad-based monetization model. Um, and that was their choice, right? I think there's a lot of 
when a company does something, it is the result of people making decisions. And that is always the case. There is nothing inevitable about anything any company does. They're not, you know, they're not organisms, right? They don't have to eat. They don't have to breathe. They are human constructs and everything that happens on behalf or because of a corporation happens due to human decisions. Um, and sometimes I think that can feel, you know, especially when you're in a, <laughs> basically a corporate space, it can feel a little bit overwhelming or easy to forget, but you know, and humans can change their mind. That's one of the wonderful things about us is that we can do things differently in the future at any point, at any point we can change our mind and do things differently. Um, so. Anyway. Uh, number one says, poor folks are the ones that most need access to those tools without any condescending Western paternalistic or voluntarily placed barriers. Um, So, okay, lot to unpack there. Um, this is something that often comes up in ethics discussions, right? Is that like when somebody from the US or Europe says something, um, it'll be like, well, you know, you're just trying to continue to, uh, you know, perpetuate American imperialism, um, which uh, is certainly not my intention and something I actively work against on this channel. Um, I am speaking of poor folks specifically in this situation in the United States, right? So um, surveillance in the United States overwhelmingly falls on people with less money. Um, and we are creating a society where privacy is something that you buy um, rather than a fundamental human right. And that's messed up. <laughs> um, and also I would say, that a lot of the technology that is being built and constructed by US companies, when it is deployed in um, other, uh, other societies and other countries, is not to the benefit of those people, of the people in that society or countries, or is to the benefit of only some of them, right? So we talked a while ago about how uh, Facebook is not doing anything to remove ads, uh, encouraging genocide in Kenya. Um, and well, certainly some people may in Kenya may think that genocide is a good thing, um, Facebook is directly profiting from something that is harming society at large in Kenya for the profit of the people who are invested in Facebook, which are over Overwhelmingly, people you know in the U.S. and Europe and other um, other Western countries. So I don't think um, it doesn't sit right with me to say, well, you can't you can't not let American companies do whatever they want uh, because it might you know happen to benefit somebody. Um, it may happen to benefit somebody, and that somebody is going to be uh, somebody who's already rich <laughs> uh, and owns a lot of stock in Facebook. Um, so yeah, and I think that this um, this article actually is a pretty good um, you know discussion of this. Uh, doop, doop, uh, and it is you know um, the role of human data labelers um, and particularly human data labelers who are doing outsourced human data labeling. Uh, so first generation uh, women workers in Indian towns and villages, and it's sort of a discussion of what that work is like. Um, and I, uh, again, I think that if something benefits some people, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't harm other people. And what I would prefer to see is for, um, you know, these workers to be building their agency and uh, their ability to build things that are useful for them and their own you know, society and needs and address those. Um, and if this is part of that pipeline, that's perfectly fine. I mean, like I've, <laughs> I've done a lot of shift work. Uh, I am very aware of the need to eat food and pay rent uh, <laughs> pressures. They are um, non-negotiable as it turns out. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily wrong to, you know, do human data labeling. Um, I think it is important if we think about whether or not these relationships are purely extractive um, and extractive in a way that, again, benefits only some people and it's, you know, um, rich, mostly white um, people from the global north. So anyway, 
good discussion. Um, uh, yep. And if this is uh, a stepping stone for these individuals in terms of becoming, you know, more uh, having more power over their lives and more ability to do things, I think that's great. Um, if it's going to cause them and their their families long term harm, I think that's that's bad. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense. I feel like we've gotten really uh, off topic here. Um, also speaking about ethics, uh, so uh, this was a discussion. We talked about my replica on Tuesday, um, and uh, sort of this company that creates um, fake friends, like basically chatbots um, that have personalities and you can buy additional functionality to. Um, and uh, Verena was on it talking about whether or not chatbots can solve loneliness and no, <laughs> they can't. Uh, speaking of trying to replicate unreplicable uh, human uh, uh, interactions. Uh, so yeah, just a good discussion. If you like podcasts, maybe a good one to check out. And it was on uh, the BBC. All right, and on that note, let's talk about some fun stuff. Uh, just a couple things today. So first of all, there was uh, a linguistics I XKCD. So XKCD, if you're not familiar, is like a nerd web comic where the joke is usually that you need to explain the joke. Um, <laughs> uh, and there was a linguistics one, which is always nice. Um, and you know, several years ago, this would have been the only thing linguistics would have talked about ever. So. Um, yeah, so the IPA vowel chart is um, a representation of vowels along the mid-sagittal plane as their relationship to the first and second harmonic. Um, first when you uh, index from zero, so I guess sec technically second or third if you're counting them. Um, yeah. <laughs> Nine Gaming says, last year we, I am from India, generated $200 billion in revenue for companies in other countries. That sucks. <laughs> um, yeah, I've also, sorry, that face was also me thinking about how India was really impacted by um, rising temperatures, especially this year. There were um, like an unbelievably hot, bad heat wave that really, really, really impacted people. Um, and you know, the, the wealth transfer and who gets to get the benefits of burning all the carbon and who gets to, you know, suffer and die because of it are not evenly distributed. <sighs> anyway, neocolonialism. Uh, we talked about um, Karen Howe. Karen Howe has a really good uh, discussion of uh, neocolonialism in tech. Uh, and she did like a series of, of uh, stories on it earlier this year that we talked about a couple of them on the channel as well. So um, yeah, another keeps happening keeps happening history doesn't uh, history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes right that that saying anyway the joke here is that it's a two dimensional graph and the uh, they are treating it as if there is a third dimension to make complex vowels so i guess it's also a little bit of a, a math joke Uh, and then finally, <laughs> Stephen Mayhew has, uh, you know, found the the best and most right machine learning hyperparameters. So that's good. Um, so this is a, a you know a Twitter thread. So you know he's you know reducing the learning rate, lower, lower, lower. Uh, and then finally, <laughs> they all failed because I have a bug in the gradient update. Uh, I wasted 2600 in AWS compute costs for legal jokes, reasons this is a joke. Follow me for more machine learning tips. Um, so he's trying to reduce the learning rate. Um, and uh, turns out uh, he was wrong all along because of another bug in his code. So anyway, I'm sure we've all had similar situations if you, if you work in the field. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think Cognition has. 
So that is all that I have for you today. And before we close it out, I just want to say thank you to my monthly supporters. Um, I appreciate it. I am uh, trying to do this full time. We'll see how it goes. Um, and y'all are definitely giving me some momentum and making that possible. And I appreciate you very much. So thank you. Um, and also, um, if you are in the link, please tier. If you're one of these people, <laughs> the links are up this morning. I should maybe have waited until after the stream and given myself more, time, more time to set up so I was less flustered, but there we go. Um, so thank you all very much. I appreciate you. It really, really helps and makes a difference to me. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. We will be back next Tuesday. Oh, thank you, Docking. Uh, really good to see you. Uh, oh, also, if you're in the coffee chat tier and above, uh, I sent out a link for that. It's going to be on the 26th, so not this Friday, but next Friday at this time, the, the usual stream time. So I uh, hope to see you all there in the coffee chat tier. Um, chit chat tier. This is coffee chat. I got to get more distinct names for stuff. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope you stay safe and stay healthy and um, enjoy life as best you can. And I'll talk to you next Tuesday for a deep dive about something. <laughs> I'll figure it out. It'll be something good. Okay. I'll talk to y'all later. Have a great day uh, and I'll see you soon. Bye.